Mobile hunters, if you're interested in upping your mobile game, then head to tetherednation.com and check out their saddle gear. There are a few things that you can buy that will actually help you become a better deer hunter or give you the freedom to hunt any tree or any situation. This reason is why I started saddle hunting in the first place and why I use Tethered's gear. I can honestly say that Tethered's saddle gear has changed how I hunt for the better. Big tree, little tree, from the ground, it doesn't matter. I'm untethered by my gear to hunt the best setup for the situation instead of hunting for a tree that my gear can use. My current core setup consists of the Phantom Saddle, Tethered One Sticks, and the Predator Platform, and along with an assortment of their accessories. So if you want to up your mobile game, head over to tetherednation.com. If you're like me, you spend a lot of time pouring over maps, looking at weather data, all in an effort to help predict when and where my best times are to hunt. It'd be nice if there was a reliable source with all this information in one place. Enter the Spartan Forge app. Unlike some other predictive apps on the market, Spartan Forge was created from military combat intelligence experience tailored for hunters and stands at the nexus of machine learning and whitetail deer hunting. No more man-made algorithms. This is a predictive model based on real GPS collared deer data, historical and predictive weather, and the next level of mapping imagery, all at my fingertips. I've had an opportunity to use the desktop version last year and have been using the iOS app this season, and it has replaced all my other mapping tools. Visit SpartanForge.ai and sign up today, or head to your iOS or Android app store and download it today. This podcast is brought to you by Skull Brew Coffee Company. Skull Brew Coffee roasts premium single origin coffee guaranteed to deliver the freshest coffee directly to your doorstep. The kicker, they're 2% for conservation certified and donate 10% of their proceeds back to organizations who support the interests of our hunting community. So go to SkullBrewCoffee.com and pick up one of their three killer roasts and fuel your hunt and fill more tags with Skull Brew Coffee. Welcome to the Truths from a Stand Deer Hunting Podcast brought to you by Skull Brew Coffee Company. I'm your host, Clint Campbell, and you're listening to episode number 262. Today, we're talking travel hunt success and filling home state tags with our nine-fingered buddy, Dan Johnson. So stay tuned. All right, all right. What is up, everyone? Happy Wednesday to you. Hope you are doing well. Hope you are feeling fine. Hope you had an awesome Christmas and are recovering from the the drink and the food coma that you might be just kind of staggering out of at this point. This week is kind of always a slew of Christmas parties and eating too much and maybe drinking too much. Depends on how responsible you you may or may not be. Uh, we had a good Christmas here at the uh, at the Campbell household. Just the, me, my wife, and my daughter kind of riding out. Just the three of us. We had <laughs> got sick basically all three of us last week. And so uh, we had some family come into town prior to us getting sick. And then the family that was going to come into town uh, are getting ready to leave for – um, it's my wife's parents. They go to the, they go down South, you know, for the, for the winter. And so they didn't want to be sick for their, uh, voyage South. So they're, they're avoiding our, our house until mid this week. But unfortunately I'm going to be gone because I am going to be headed out on probably my last travel hunt of the season, uh, hopping in the trailer here, probably Monday night or Tuesday afternoon and headed to a spot that I've been scouting, <clears throat> you know, last off season and things of that nature, got up once in October to hunt, have some really good deer up there, just kind of washed it for the year. And so this trip is really kind of a, a late season hunt slash um, scouting mission. So probably going to scout walk a lot during the day and then just kind of set up, you know, somewhere in the evening. If I find somewhere where it feels like deer are going to be spending some time for late season, the bummer of it is, is I was really hoping to have some snow so I could do some tracking. Um, you know, and maybe figuring out where they're spending some time, but it looks like I'm going to have precipitation of the uh, rain variety versus, uh, versus snow, which is a little bit of a bummer, but we will, we will make do, um, got to keep this up front pretty short today and just kind of get to it. Cause I got some chores. I got to get to, to try to finish my basement before the, the new year's, uh, soiree that we have, that we have planned. So with that, want to make quick mention, head over to truthfromthestand.com, use the promo code TFTS21 on the merch tab, save yourself some cash, get yourself some uh, cool merch, and then be sure to head over to skullbrewcoffee.com and check that uh, check that out as well. If you're looking for coffee or travel packs, we have travel packs that I always use whenever I'm out on the road hunting. Uh, don't suffer through shitty coffee. You don't have to. 
SkullbrewCoffee.com will, will set you up with some killer pour overs. With that, we have a cool show for you guys today. I have my good buddy Dan Johnson on from the Sportsman's Nation, also known or also as the uh, the Nine Finger Chronicles. A lot of you guys are probably familiar with him. Dan, super good dude. Always like having him on. You know, he had some DIY hunts that he's been doing the past couple of years in the Dakotas um, and just had some near misses and just didn't quite get it done. And this year he finally filled his first out of state buck tag in the Dakotas. Um, and he was kind of out there for muley and then, you know, whitetail opportunities kind of popped up. And so I was super stoked to talk to him because he's doing a lot of spot and stock out there. And I kind of had that similar situation on my first spot and stock uh, trip to Kansas this year. And we just kind of talked about the different kind of the learning curve for that and, you know, how he kind of overcame that and and how he had, you know, different setups and things he had to learn along the way, you know, failures he had to have along the way in order to kind of in order to kind of make it happen. And then we also then pivoted, as you guys probably know, Dan lives in Iowa you know, and it lives in the part of Iowa that is, is great for big white tails. Um, and he had a really killer hunt this year, you know, on a, on a deer that he was after. And, and what people don't probably understand is that even though, you know, Dan lives in, in Iowa and he hunts a farm, um, it's not his and his alone. He's hunting it with a couple other guys that hunted it as well. So it's not like it's an unpressured piece of property. Um, yes, there are good deer there, but Dan also has to take into consideration what other guys are doing and paying attention to how they're hunting and, and things of that nature. And so we talked a little bit about that and how he actually used that other hunter pressure uh, to kind of help inform his setups for this year and ultimately filling his tag on a monster Iowa whitetail. So with that, we're going to go ahead and jump into today's podcast. And as always, I want to thank you all for listening. All right, folks, welcome back to another episode of the Truth From The Stand Deer Hunting Podcast. And today, the dulcet tones on the other end of the line, you will recognize they're, they will be familiar to you. If there was a visual, he might have a nubbin and be missing a digit. I'm talking to none other than Mr. Dan Nine Fingers Johnson. What's going on, brother? <laughs> Uh, it's good. I love the intros, man, because they're unique every time. Yeah. And every, I mean, you know, in a in a way where I didn't know that there were so many ways to introduce someone who had their finger chopped off in a horrible industrial accident. Yeah, <laughs> I know. Well, I mean, I think it, it lends it's a very unique story. Um, and you have a corner on that market on the on the <laughs> nine finger market. Um, so I think that it's, I think that it's fitting, you know, it's a unique story for a unique guy. How about that? Yeah. The, the conversation always comes up though. What happens if I lose another finger? Like, am, am I now tied to nine fingers, even if I only have eight or seven fingers? Right. Yeah. That's a good, I mean, you would almost have to rebrand man. Like, yeah. or it could just be like the nine, you could just do like a minus two. Or something like that on it, you know what I mean? Make it like a math equation and just like really screw everybody up. <laughs> so I got to tell you, man, it was, uh, you know, we've got to, you know, text in and got to know each other better over the years and stuff like that. But before we knew each other, you know, relatively well, I was actually going to do an April fool's joke with you and was going to hope that it didn't piss you off terribly. And I was going to, <laughs> I was going to do, and it's funny, our mutual friend, Chad Sylvester was in on it too. And he was like, dude, you got to do it. You got to do it. He's like, he might get pissed at you at first. He's like, but he'll think it's funny. And, uh, I was going to basically do like a, a like a, Hey, Dan Johnson, I'm one up in you and like do a whole like video of me chopping off two of my fingers <laughs> and then like spoof, a spoof it on your logo with like eight fingers. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, so, yeah, but, uh, you know, that was just one of those harebrained ideas that I unfortunately ran out of time to, uh, <laughs> ran out of time to do. <laughs> so, Love but, it. Love but we're, uh, Dan and I are recording this on a Friday night. We are both are, I'm getting ready to pour me a bourbon. I'm going to let you hear the, the pop of the cork out of the bourbon bottle. Okay. Oh, did you hear that? Oh, oh yeah. Nice. I, I like it. Yeah. I'm, uh, I'm pouring a drink right now after a long day at work. This is uh, episode is affectionately referred to as bourbon and bucks. Yes. We, yes. Could almost, we could almost make that a weekly thing. It'd probably be hell for my, for my, my liver, but could yeah, be a good time. You know, as long as it's a, a once a week deal and not like five days a week, I right. think we'd be all right. Yeah. But I think I probably do bourbon and bucks on my own a couple nights a week. Yeah, um, you're right. <laughs> you're right. <laughs> you know, who am I, who am I kidding? So I'm having so what's a, your bourbon? What's oh, your bourbon? I, I was just going to ask you that. So I am drinking a, it's a High West uh, American Prairie bourbon. It was a gift. Oh. Uh, a friend of mine was visiting family in Utah, and we were having like a, a get together after they were getting back. And so they knew that I'm really into bourbon. So they picked me up a, uh, a bourbon from Utah. And it's a fitting because it has a pronghorn on it. And so we're talking hunting. So there you go. How about yeah. you? 
I, I like High West. Yeah. Uh, I like that bourbon. I am drinking a Basil Hayden. Oh, yes. And uh, it's probably top five, if I had to guess. Like, it's pretty funny. Everybody, Everybody's like, oh, dude, Jack Daniels. You know, I like Jack Daniels. Jack Daniels is a everyday Mm-hmm. Like, uh, uh, if you're going someplace, you don't know what to get and, and everybody, it, it, you know, get Jack. Exactly. Daniels. Exactly. There are, there are so many, like once I, once, yeah, once I've started opening up and tasting new bourbons, man, they're just, just four miles from my house. And this is, and I've tasted a lot of bourbons is probably one of my favorites. Uh, it's called Cedar Ridge. It's based out of uh, uh, Swisher, Iowa, and it just went to some uh, bourbon expose and just crushed a whole bunch of Kentucky bourbons. Nice. Like I'm actually writing that down as where you said Cedar Ridge. Is that what it was? Yep. Yep. Cedar Ridge. Nice. Yeah. Because I, I I dig me some some bourbon. I just redid my basement. And I have a full bar in my basement, and so now it's like I'm getting ready to put the shelves back in. And I need to re-up my bourbon stock since the uh, the basement's been completed. So I've been kind of going back through, and I've got my my staples and my favorite. Like I like a High West. Basil Hayden is in my at my bar right now. It was it was up between High West and, and Basil Hayden. Also yeah. a big kind of Blanton's fan. Um, you know, there's a oh, there's another one if you've never had it called Willet that is like one of my one of my favorites. I don't get it very often. White or uh, Widow Jane from New York is a really good one. Yep. There there was a period of time where I was, I would just go to like little towns and find a distillery and tour the distillery and try all their hooch essentially. Yeah. Um, yeah. It was, uh, it was an, in, it was a good, it was, I mean, I love going to check that stuff out just like the process of how they make it and, and, and stuff like that. And then just taste all the different varieties that they have. And so I was yep. picking up bottles from like all over the place and, uh, had quite the stash. Cause I do enjoy me a good bourbon and a good cigar. Yeah. Are you a cigar guy? You know, I, I am. However, I'm always home and I, I, I have this vision where when I make it, when I make it like Mm -hmm. whenever in business, I want to, I want a chair. I want a leather chair (laughs) with a end table right next to it. I want an ashtray and I see myself in this future, like the kids are in bed or they're, they're, we're done for the day. And I go and I pour myself a, a, a glass of bourbon and I puff on a cigar for a little bit. Like that is, that's the end game right there. Right. So I'm envisioning like a, a nine fingered version of, of Ron Burgundy is what I'm kind of envisioning. <laughs> <laughs> that's Holy what shit. I, that's what I got instead of, instead of like, <laughs> instead of the smell of leather bound books, you know, and deep mahogany, it's going to be the smell of like taxidermy. And like bow wax, you know, <laughs> is, is what I'm envisioning, man. Is that, is that a fair kind of vision? Oh yeah. I mean, I'm a, I'm a, I'm kind of a dipshit like Ron Burgundy. So I can see how that would uh, <laughs> all play together. <laughs> oh man. That's awesome. Well, hopefully here one of these days, man, I'll either make it out to Iowa again. Well, I, I should be back out in, uh, I think two more years. I think I, I should be able to draw and make my way back out there. So we'll definitely have to get together. I will bring you a good yeah. cigar and we will go find some yeah. good bourbon somewhere and we will share a stick and a drink uh, together, which I think Absolutely. would be, would be awesome. Hell yeah, man. I'm down for just about any reason to get out of the house these days. Right. There you go. <laughs> so we, we'll, we'll make that happen. You only have to wait like two years and we'll make that happen. So, you know, hey man, hey man I'm down. Awesome. We'll, we'll, we will certainly do that. So it, we, it would be a, it wouldn't be a nearly or around Christmas podcast if i didn't ask you are you all ready for christmas has has santa landed dude i'm the worst (laughs) i am the guy who i I don't want to sound like a scrooge here but i just don't get fired up for holidays i i like holidays for one reason and it's because my whole family's all my family gets together Mm -hmm. and it's not about the christmas but it's more of like, we're, we're a card family. So we play cards Okay, and we are very competitive when it comes to cards to the point where my, my sweet loving 85 year old grandmother is starts talking shit on me and my brother 
because she's like, oh, I love you so much, but like, I'm going to kick the shit out of you at the card table tonight. <laughs> like that, that kind of, and it's fun. So for me, it's less about, you know, like, I, I don't know, I'm horrible. My wife is like, if it wasn't for me, your kids wouldn't ha- get presents. I'm like, yeah, you're right. They wouldn't. So yeah, I went to, I, I'm that last minute shopper, but it's more about the family and, and getting together and, and cards for me, man. Yeah. I, uh, I'm kind of the same. Like I always tell my wife, I'm like, I, I'm the worst gift giver on the planet. Like it's, it's a known fact in my family. If you're getting, if I, if I draw your name for Christmas, you're getting a shitty gift. Like that is book it a hundred percent. And, uh, right. You know, and uh, so my wife, of course, bless her heart. She does like all the shopping for our daughter. Our daughter's 13 now. So like, you know, Santa yeah. isn't real for her any anymore, of yeah. course, you know, so which makes it a little easier because you can just kind of be straight up like, hey, what are you what are you looking for this year? You know, <laughs> type of thing. Yeah. And uh, but she does mostly everything. I This year, I'm actually ahead of the game. Like I actually got my wife's gift. And then I always do like a, a daddy daughter gift, you know, for my daughter. Like yeah. I get her something specific. And it's usually like something we can do together. But my favorite part is kind of what you were saying you know, it's just kind of like my, my mom and my stepdad are down today visiting kind of pre Christmas. Cause we're not going to be able to make it back, uh, over the holiday. Cause m- my daughter's traveling with like one of her friends over new year's and stuff like that. Um, and then I think my wife's parents are coming down like Christmas day. Um, yeah. so we'll be kind of all squared away. So we'll get to see our family and stuff like that. But my favorite part of Christmas is ba- you know, the industry I work in, usually you always have that week between Christmas <clears throat> and new year's off as like a paid company holiday. Yep. And so for me, I get super stoked about that because I'm usually always holding a buck tag in Pennsylvania <laughs> into late right. season. And then yep. it actually gives me like a nice kind of like semi vacation to get out into the woods for like for a few days consistently and get some late season hunting in and not feel yep. like I'm just kind of throwing a dart at a dartboard. I can actually go out and hunt, you know, three days, four days in a row and actually make a plan as yeah. opposed to just going, mm, man, I think I saw red oak acorns over here, you know, this fall while I was scouting you know, and, and, and yeah. doing it off memory, I can actually go out and spend some time or maybe even wait for some snow and do some tracking, which would be awesome. So that's what I get fired up about spending some yeah. time with family and then getting a little bit of a consistent late season bow hunting in. So that's, uh, yeah, that's what I dig, but you're all filled yeah. up, man. So you're all good. Do you have one more tag in, in Iowa this year or no? Yeah. So right now, as we record this, we're going in, I don't know when you're going to launch this episode. I'm, I'm, I take it next week or after that. But by then, the Iowa shotgun season will be over. Then I can go put my trail cameras back out and see if I can't lo- locate something worth shooting. Mm-hmm. Um, the 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 consensus right now is good three year olds, mm-hmm. and so I could go out. I, I've had one hell of a year already. I could go out and shoot something that would be for me. Like I look at it this way, it would be a great late season buck this year to Mm -hmm. go out, you know, go out and try to chase something like that. But it would be a great 2022 rut buck. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, so I, I'm just trying to take a little inventory, see what the shotgun hunters kind of kicked up and, uh, and, and play it, play it by ear. And if, uh, if there's, if all of a sudden, you know, a a mature deer shows up on camera on, on this farm close to my house, I'm going to go out there and I'm going to give her hell for a couple of days. But other than that, if nothing shows up on camera and I'll be mm-hmm. checking them fairly frequently, I'll be uh, just in the office. Yeah, no, I hear you. And this will drop, I think, the week between Christmas and, and, and New Year. So this conversation is yeah. comple- completely appropriate. I'm kind yeah. of, you know, I, I, I'm still holding like just a regular buck tag and PA is a, you know, one buck state, you yeah. know, so I'm definitely going to be out. But I'm, you know. I'm kind of in a similar boat. It was funny. I talked to Tony Peterson about this because he was like, put me on the spot. He was like, you know, because I'm like, I, I just want to get around deer in late season, you know, and then make a plan from there. Because sometimes in PA with all the pressure, because our gun season went out uh, when this was re- when this drops, it'd probably be like two, maybe three weeks. I forget. Uh, December 11th is when it went out. Yeah, I uh, was a lot was the last day. Um, and I do the same thing as you where it's like, well, that I'm assuming you do. It's like, I pull all my cameras right before gun season comes just so they don't get legs and, and walk. And then I'll kind of redeploy them and try to make, you know, make a game plan. But the weird thing was there's a new piece that I'd been hunting or been scouting in the off season. Um, you know, a piece of big woods, it's a little bit ways from my house. And so I'm really kind of planning to go up there. That's why I'm waiting for snow. Cause I can do some backtrack and at least get some Intel 
for next year. But um, what I'm a little leery of is on that piece at the very beginning of December, there was a buck that was pretty consistent, a good buck, but he was coming through like right around dark. Like I was never getting him in like hundred percent daylight. It was always like 30 minutes after an hour after 30 minutes before or an hour before or whatever the case was. And he passed through like, like the first week of December, for some reason, the third sticks in my mind and he had already cast or dropped both of his antlers. Yeah. You know, it, and so it makes me a little leery. Yeah, man. Yeah. It, yeah. It makes me a little leery of like trying to fill a buck tag thinking that, you know, if, you know, he clearly was going to make it through. Well, I mean, he might've got shot as a doe, but you know, he, if he made it through, he was going to be a really good deer next year. And I would hate to shoot one of my target bucks yeah. after they've already dropped their antlers, you know, and then walk up on it yeah. like major kick in the balls. Right. So, you know, yeah. I have some doe tags to fill, so I think I'm going to kind of prioritize those. And if I happen to see one of the deer that I was after this year, um, then then that's kind of a bonus. But I think I'm just going to kind of go out and try to learn some stuff on this piece of big woods and then fill some doe tags at the same time locally. So that's I think that's the plan. Yeah. Yeah, I feel you, man. I just, uh, you know, I think I already got pictures of a shed buck on, on one of my cell cams, hmm. but it was kind of an awkward angle. Uh, so I'm not a hundred, I wasn't a hundred percent sure if it was a doe or a buck, it was big bodied mm -hmm. and, uh, I couldn't see it. I couldn't see the tarsal glands, but it was a, uh, a big bodied deer it looked like it could have been a buck and, uh, which, which isn't really uncommon this time of year. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. And like, I could tell clearly this was definitely, it was definitely him just like he has yeah. a. Uh, he has a marking that's kind of un, uh, you know, uh, pretty obvious, you know, on him. But then beyond that, you could clearly see like he must have just lost them because like you could see even in the the trail camera picture like the red on top of his head, like the two dots. Oh you wow! Know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it was it was within twenty four hours, I would say, that he had lost them. So which that's the earliest I'd ever seen before. You know, like I usually yeah. early for me around here is like probably around now. You know yeah. what I mean? Like if I start to see him, it's not, it's, it's early, but it's not completely unusual, um, yeah. for, to start to see one or two. But at the beginning of December, I remember seeing that picture. And I was like, well, hot damn. I was like, that's kind of crazy. I was like, that makes me a little leery for gun season coming up. Someone thinking they're shooting a doe and killing a, you know, a deer that was a quality animal, but yeah, is what it is. But man, you had, like you mentioned, you kind of, uh, did a little pr uh, prelude to this when you mentioned you had a hell of a year and uh i would i would agree with you man like you've you've had a, a killer season i know you know we'll just start at the beginning dude like i know you've been going out to south dakota for a couple seasons now and it felt like you finally got the monkey off your back headed out there and i wanted to kind of dive into that hunt so how many how many years so this was your first season filling an out-of-state whitetail tag right but you've been going out to south dakota for a couple years right yeah now just put an asterisk on that okay on that comment because i went out this was my third year going but it was like my it was my fourth trip out because last okay. year i went i went to south dakota twice once in october and then once again in in december to try to fill the tag but my my goal every single year is mule deer it's, mm -hmm. it's a species that is on my list and that's all i think about these days for the most part is like i, I want to shoot a mule deer right so the whole plan this all this time was to go out there and try to get a mule deer. And the first year I had my, I had an opportunity. I hit, I one lunged one mm. and unfortunately never recovered him. Um, yeah. I don't know if I necessarily, I, I'm not a hundred percent sure, but I don't think I gave him enough time. I think I, I may have bumped him right. like looking for him. Fast forward to the next year. I went twice. That was last year. And I had some, I had some opportunities that, on day one or two, I, there was a small mule deer buck that I passed and I should have shot. And, uh, I don't know. I, I, it was one of those things where I was thinking about, I, I don't want to say I was blind to antlers, but I, I didn't want it to end whatever yeah. it was I was doing. I didn't want it to end. So I passed, I played cat and mouse with a couple of, uh, decent bucks and long story short, I passed some mule deer doe. And, uh, you know, it never came together this year. We started off the same way last year, looking for mule deer. And then we came into a, a spot where it was just loaded with whitetails. And it, it, it was one of those things where it was just like, I would have been stupid to leave this place. 
just right. because of, of all the activity that we were seeing fresh tracks, fresh shine. Um, I mean, we came to this place, uh, after a mule, after we were looking for mule deer one morning, and then we came to this spot and it was like, just the sign was overwhelming. And so I said, Hey, let's give, let's give this up. Let's give this place an opportunity tonight. And Holy cow. It just, it, it ended up coming together. Right. So whenever you're headed out there, man, are you, you know, it sounds like you had a couple opportunities that were, that were early and you mentioned getting, you know, antler blind or whatever the case was like, what was your standard kind of, as you were headed out there, did you have an idea of like, I, Cause I know for me, for example, like if I'm headed out of state to, to bow hunt whitetail somewhere like this year, I was in Kansas and I wasn't, or even whenever I went to Iowa, yeah. I wasn't going like, I'm trying to shoot a 170 or better or a 150 or better. Yeah. I was literally going, you know what, if it's a good Pope and young buck, you know, that's like 130 inches or better, like I'm fired up. And if it fires me up, I'm shooting it. You know, that was kind of yeah. like always my criteria. Now, I've done that in Iowa once already now. So when I get the chance to come back to Iowa, I'm probably going to kind of hold out for something better than I got the first time. You know what I mean? Like just, yeah. you know, just because they're, they're there, you know what I mean? I know the better bucks are there. I, I missed a better buck, you know, earlier in that trip. So I'm just curious, you know, what are your standards when you're kind of headed out, to, headed out on these trips? Yeah. So my standard was I want to shoot a mule deer. Mm -hmm. And so I, we get to this location on year one, we evaluate and on day two, we, man, we saw a ton of awesome bucks mm -hmm. and my, the guy I was with, he shot a stud, mm -hmm. uh, while we were out there. And then, like I said, I arrowed a, a medium sized buck and never found him year two, a little bit more difficult, uh, went and did the same thing. I put a stock on a really good, uh, mule deer buck. And I passed a couple smaller, le which were legal. Any, I think anything with a fork. So like any six inches of antler basically right. is a legal, a legal buck out there. And so I passed a couple of those. And, um, then I run, ran into some private ground that I got access to where it was stacked with deer. And, uh, that's where I kind of got antler blind where mm -hmm. I, uh, there was a bedded buck. And he was facing away from me. And I just, I literally walked up kind of peeking into this, this small little drainage. And it was the perfect shot. I, I mean, I could have had him, but I'd already seen all these other bigger mule deer. And I said to myself, well, Hey, hell, you might as well give it a try. Mm -hmm. And then, and then, so that didn't work out, came back in December, um, played cat and mouse with, uh, some, with mule deer the whole time and never had the opportunity at anything I mean, not even a shot at any type of legal buck, just mule deer doe. And so I was kind of holding that. Well, I take that back. I did run into a, a three by three out there the very last day. And, uh, I put a stock on him and he, he busted me and, uh, uh, he saw me draw and, and he ran away. But then this year, just that's kind of the, the, the preface to this year. And I said to myself, if you want to shoot a mule deer, you got to shoot a mule deer. So any legal animal was going to get an arrow this year. Right. Now in the unit that I was in this year, it was a no, you, you could not shoot a mule deer doe anymore this year. So it was, and which was kind of good because it eliminated thought process for anything else I needed to do. Right. So it was, if, you know, I wasn't waiting around if I saw a doe group that didn't have a buck in it. Um, so I went out. I started to, uh, look for mule deer bucks. And on, on day one of that South Dakota hunt, uh, we ran into a couple decent mule deer bucks, but they were a long ways away. And then one of them busted us. And then on day two is when we went to another spot and it was all cattle, right? So it was, a, it was a walk-in unit or a walk-in property that, you know, the landowner gives permission, uh, through the state to walk in and hunt, but it was loaded with cattle. I mean, grazed down to the dirt. And so we went to check out this other property, um, the, you know, this piece of public, and that's where we ran into all the whitetail sign. Hmm. And so I was like, well, let's, <laughs> uh, let's see what's here. And so then it quickly turned into, to a whitetail hunt. Right. All right. So I'm, I'm curious, man, for, it was, uh, I don't want to say eye-opening necessarily, but 
I definitely learned some hard lessons this year in Kansas hunting off the ground, like 95% of the time and spotting and stalking, you know? Yeah. Um, so I'm curious for you, you know, having, cause that's, I've hunted from the ground before, you know, I, I hunt from the ground some in Pennsylvania, if I'm in an area that I need to be in, that doesn't have a climbable tree, you know, or if the setup is just better, if I'm on the ground or, you know, whatever the case is, or when I was in Missouri, I hunted a little bit off the ground and, and stuff like that. So if I have to, I will, but I, yeah. I, I typically I'm in a, in a tree, you know, the majority of the time, this was a trip where I was kind of. I don't want to say, well, I'll say it. I was challenging myself to hunt differently than I've hunted before. And, you know, and I was out there with Chad Sylvester and he and I were yeah. kind of hell bent on, you know, white tail uh, adrenaline style. Like we wanted to decoy spot stock yep. hunt from the ground. Like, you know, we wanted that whole experience. And so I think out of the whole two weeks, I think I hunted out of a tree two times, maybe three, um, in, in total and probably didn't even equate yeah. to a full, to a full day sit necessarily. Um, And so I'm just curious, like, I mean, I definitely got humbled, you know, hunting on the ground for the first time exclusively. I'm curious what your experience has been, you know, in that, you know, using that method or that, that tactic to try to get after mule deer or whitetail. Yeah, I mean, um, the, the air, like the airs have to go way down. Yeah. There, they, those animals out there are so in tune with their environment. They do not take any risks. Mm-hmm. Uh, what's crazy about a mule deer at, at, as opposed to a whitetail and if, and I can understand why a mule deer during a gun season would definitely get shot, but you, you turn, you make a mistake with a mule deer, they will stare you down It almost, it feels like into your soul <laughs> and, and they will not move until they are 100% sure what you are. And that, and then they'll just split and they'll bounce away and they'll go over a ridge and, and then they calm down and you might, you knock on wood, you might be able to go uh, stalk them again. But with a white tail out there, they're gone, period. Yeah. There, there is no second chance, man. I, for, they are so different than the white tail that I hunted in Iowa, the white tail that I've hunted in, in, in Michigan. Mm-hmm. Um, like, uh, a whitetail in Michigan and like is way different than Iowa, right? In Iowa, right. I can, I can get away with some stuff mm-hmm. in Michigan. I could get away with a lot less, but out there, man, they, they don't even question like they, a deer, other deer may come and investigate, mm-hmm. but the deer out there, they don't investigate. They know that running away from whatever they think it is, is their best bet. So that's what they do. Yeah, it's it's interesting, you know, the mistakes are I mean, yeah. Th- you just can't have them on the ground. You, you know, it's it's one of those things. And I kind of knew that going out, you know, you can and the thing is, is you can talk to as many people like I've talked to the Schefflers and the Farrenbaugh's and like the Claypools and stuff like that to pick their brain about how they go about doing it. And you can have people tell you about it as much as you want to until you go out and you actually do it and you screw it up and you're like, yeah. "Oh, that's what they were talking about. Right. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like that was, that was definitely my, my experience. You know, I had, yeah. um, I guess probably two, you know, uh, two opportunities, you know, one in which I had my, that I pulled my bow back and another one where I had, I was close or I had, you know, had a, uh, a shooter that was within, you know, uh, bow range within like 20 yards. Yeah. And the one that I got pulled back on, he was just, he was a cagey animal, you know, and he just was not going to make any mistakes. I snort wheezed him back in and then he certainly was going to go downwind to try to scent check me before he was going to roll right in, you yeah. know, and, uh, and I had a decoy up and he saw the decoy and he was just like, yeah, you know what? I think the other part too, is I think whenever you're hunting from the ground like that, especially if you're decoying and stuff, at least in my opinion, and this is just, you know, a layman's opinion, cause I'm not an expert at ground hunting, but what I started kind of understanding a little bit is that if you're going to decoy you might get one to come bristle up and just walk right in and want to kick ass, but he's got to be the alpha there in that area. Yeah. If you have a subordinate buck in that area that you snort wheeze at, or he sees your decoy, he might want to come in and want to throw down, you know, or at least test the water. But if he's not the alpha, he's certainly going to play the game of, you know, I'm going to try to get downwind of you. And then out there in like prairie ground, like where you're at and shit like that, 
there's not a whole lot to get in between you and the deer to try to get downwind. It's not like you're in PA where you can get up behind like a, a cliff or like, you know, something like that to get some back cover or whatever. So they can't get behind you. It's like a lot of times I was hunting out in the middle of a freaking open CRP field in a ghillie jacket. <laughs> yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. Where it's like, it, I don't have any ability to kind of cut him off or make him move in a certain direction. It's like, I'm just kind of naked and hoping I can get a shot before he hits my scent stream essentially, you know? So, yeah. but yeah. So, so how was, one, so, one so thing, I'm sorry, go ahead. One thing that I, I, I it's like, if you skyline yourself, yeah, it's over. Yeah, for and sure. What's up, what's up about that? And is always the path of least resistant out there, right? The flat mm-hmm. tops and, mm-hmm. and trying to get someplace. And then there's a drop off. So you're side hilling it basically to try to stay, you know, not skyline yourself. And then if you're in direct sunlight, I, I noticed that then they don't question that. But if you're in some form of shade, yeah, they will, it's almost like they give you a little break. They, they'll look into that shaded area and they'll be like, ah, eh, okay, well. You know, if the sun's to your back and maybe they're looking into a, a, a shaded hillside uh, or if you're if you're there and they'll they'll kind of just work their way by. But if they're close, obviously, they're they're not going to you know, they're not going to take any chances. But that's how we kind of I try to find some kind of shade or a little crevice. The same type of crevices that they hide in is what I'm trying to hide in and, and use to my advantage. And And the other thing that I learned was. Man, if they are already on their feet and you're trying to catch up with them, it's 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 over. You might as well just call it and try to trying to find something else. Yeah, yeah, and that's what I started kind of doing toward the you know the end. And it, and the funny thing is, when you start talking about shade and stuff like that, yeah, you know, because I would always try to you. Know, the, you <laughs> I ended up screwing myself on a couple of different occasions because I got in an area where I had some cover and some shade, but it also significantly limited me in terms of like shot opportunities, you know, just by the, you know, by the setup. And that was the other challenging thing. It's like a lot of times when you can get into a tree, it's like you can, you know, if you can trim, of course, then you can kind of create your, your shooting lanes and your shooting opportunities and stuff like that. And even if like you're in public, you can kind of move limbs out of the way or zip tie them off and stuff like that. And you, you probably have a lot more shooting than you think you do in a lot, in a lot of cases um, when you're in a tree. But out there, it's like whenever you're tucked in between like two or three cedar trees, it's, you know, and it's like, I can only see in front of me and slightly to my left. It's like, if that deer doesn't come through that particular area and he's got, and because it's flat and there's not a lot of like, uh, like undulation of the land or debris to kind of move them, you know, to kind of predict right. where they're going to move. It's, it's almost like I would almost equate it to hunting big woods deer to where they almost just kind of nomadically kind of move around. You know what I mean? To where yeah. it's like where they're going to pop up from. It's kind of hard to, at least that was my experience. I had a hard time being able to tell exactly where they were going to kind of come from. And so I got surprised a few times where I was like, well, shit, there's one, you know, it's like, yeah, didn't see him. And then you're on the ground. So you can't see nearly as well, you yeah. know? And, and the other thing that I didn't, and I'm curious if you had this experience too, was I didn't realize being on the ground, how much the CRP and just the ground level, ground level foliage was going to kill the sound of deer approaching. Oh yeah. The, just the muffling yeah. of the sound. Like I could not like when you're in a tree, there was one spot that I hunted from the ground and I could not hear a deer approach to save my life. The next day I actually hunted in a similar area, just maybe 30, 40 yards away and got into yeah. a tree and I had some deer come, you know, come from behind me and I picked them up from like 75 yards away. Yeah. You know, and it's just, it's yeah. crazy how much that, do you have the same experience? Well, I mean, when I go out West, I, I don't, I don't even bring a tree stand. Right. Um, so mo- all my, hun- uh, all my hunts are from the ground, but I will say this, I get it right. Mm-hmm. I, if I'm just going to compare sound of a deer walking through the woods to the sound of a deer on the ground while I'm on the ground, you know? Yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, I get it. It's one of those things where you better see them first before they see you. Exactly. Yeah. Cause you sure yeah. she ain't going to hear them early enough. You right. Know? And, and well, in a right. lot of cases. Right. And yeah. And then when you're out in those kind of plains t- types of states and shit like that, you're also dealing with you usually have a fair amount of wind that's happening, too. So you also have oh, like, yeah. the rustling of grasses and stuff like that to where even on a good day, you probably still ain't going to hear it, you know, just based on like the amount yeah. of wind you're going to have. Because I, I, 
that could be a benefit to you. you yeah, for I mean? sure. You can use it as yeah. cover sound for sure. It's like if you can pick one out and you got it bedded or, you know, it's milling around somewhere grazing and being slow and you got the right wind, you can certainly kind of slip up on them and stuff like that for sure. Yeah, for sure. But, uh, so man, so you went out from mule deer and you, you ran into some, you ran into some, uh, some white tail signs. So walk me through kind of what, uh, and I followed, I followed your hunts, like while you were out there on, on Instagram stories and stuff like that, I was kind of tracking along with you, what you were going on. I saw you getting buffeted by the wind, like Pooh and piglet, you know, yeah, yeah, <laughs> just getting ripped. Um, so you find some white tail sign and now you're, you're going like, do you shift gears? You're like, all right, I'm hunting white tail. Like what happened then? Well, it, it was just one of those things where when this is how it, I mean, you look on social media and you look, you, you watch content, a majority of the deer that are killed. Now I'm not saying all of them, mm. right? A majority of the deer are killed, are killed through an outfitter or on private ground or, um, you know, yeah. Mm. And I'm going to say that's the law of averages right now. You take, you take some guys who are really in tune with their environment and they're able to live on the private that they hunt and follow deer all year round. Yes. They're, they're going to be successful on, on public. But for me, it was, and, and out West it was okay. I'm, I've never been here before other than e-scouting. Mm-hmm. I'm going to show up. Okay. I show up cattle. Well, that's kind of rules out that, that place. Uh, or you, then you backdoor it and maybe you step up and you're, you start glassing cattle, right? So, or there's no habitat there because cattle have just been pulled off. And like I said, it was grazed down to the dirt. So there's nothing there for the deer to even, there's no reason for the deer to even be there. Right. So once you find a location, and, uh, you know, you can, you can get in and you can do some glassing and, and, uh, and scouting, then you can locate them. And, and so locating an animal is, 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 is kind of harder than it looks. And anybody can locate them through a, a, a spotting scope or a binocular out there, but then having the terrain and the vegetation and all that other stuff kind of line up to, to say, Hey, you know what? This is actually going to be a good spot. That's, that's huntable. Right. And so when I got to this whitetail spot and I noticed all the, this deer sign, I said to myself, man, this is a huntable spot, Mm -hmm. right? We have, we can see whitetails in the field, um, on this, on this private piece, they're heading back into their beds. It looks like into this vegetation and that part we could not hunt. And they're going to come out to, to us in the evening. And so I think we should, we should walk up here and go check it out. And we did, and we walked up and there, sure enough, more sign. And we had all these, it, it was, uh, all these little cuts. It looked like they they could have been up in here too. And so we were checking these cuts on the way back to that. We, we made a big loop on this piece. And so we were, we were down low saw all the sign then we went up high and kind of looped the whole area uh, on our way back to the truck and i said hey man let's uh let's let's poke our head over here and, and check out some of these cuts and so there was three of them we checked and we saw some sign but we didn't really we didn't see any deer and sure enough the last cut there were two whitetail bucks bedded mm-hmm. in it um one was a uh a magnificent eight pointer for out there. Nice. Like I'm going to, I'm going to say 140 class eight pointer. Wow. That's a, and, that's a and, hammer dude. Yeah. And so I, I made a stock on him and as I stood up to draw back at, I think I was like 56 yards. <laughs> he, uh, he caught me. And like I said, they don't take chances out there up gone, right? right? Just mm-hmm. gone. And, um, and so that blew that little drainage out, but you know, we had all of this other, uh, all of this other whole property to, to check out that night. So we went back to the truck, waited, um, you know, we were just chilling there and the, the rancher who had cattle on that piece of public came up to us and he goes, Hey, are you guys going to be hunting down here tonight? And I said, yeah, we're, you know, we had planned to go back over here. He's like, okay, cool. I'm going to hunt tonight too. But I just, I didn't want to get in your hair. And I'm like, oh, that's very nice of you. You know, right. like, uh, whatever. 
And he go, and I, so I asked him, Hey, what time do the deer start stepping out? And he's like, well, they start stepping out. The does start coming out at about three 30. And sure enough, at sunset was like, at you know, it was mid October at this point. And at sunset was like six 30, seven o'clock. And, um, so we got out there early. There was a fence line that divided the private and the public. And all these tumbleweeds had blown up against it. So we were looking around for places to hunt. Like, man, it's flat here. It's flatter and flat. Like, what are we going to do? We decided to make a little ground blind out of tumbleweeds and some dead, some branches that had fallen off this only tree. And when, when I say tree, I, I mean, it's like 10 foot tall right uh tree and we we built a ground we built a ground blind uh, in this fence line and we sat in the shade that we created <laughs> nice the uh I'm, I'm curious man that first buck in hindsight was there anything that you think that you could have done differently to possibly get an opportunity at that deer aside from like you got drawn on him and stuff like that but was there anything when you look back on it that you go man, you know what? I probably could have done this or I probably could have just been a little bit more patient. Cause I know for me looking back on some of the stuff from Kansas in hindsight, well, I was, you know, had 24 hours to drive home to think about all the things I screwed yeah. up, you know, in hindsight, I'm looking at it going like, Oh, you're so stupid. Like, why did you do that? Like you could have done this and this and that, you know, all the things were really obvious to me in hindsight. I'm sure I'm curious if you have, if you've had like a similar kind of revelation as you were kind of, as you look back on that particular stock. Yeah. So I, I don't know. I could have, um, I could have backed out, looped way around, and I mean way around, and put myself on the opposite side of this drainage, and maybe crept down. But I would have had a lot of things in the way mm. that that would have potentially screwed it up. Um, I think what I did was right, but because the wind was in my favor the whole time. Now, if I was on the other side, the wind, there was a chance he would have, would have winded me or I could have came up the draw and just like really crept slower and slower and slower. But I think what I did was right. I just, I probably rushed it to be mm -hmm. honest with you. There was a time where his head came up and he started staring in my direction and I was looking through like real short grass and, and just seeing his antlers. And then every time there was like a five minute period where he was standing right there by us. Mm. And I said to myself, the next time he turns his head, I'll, I'll, I'll make him move. And so he turned his head. Well, what happened was there was two bucks bedded real close to each other. And I was watching one of them. And then I shifted and I was then looking at the other one. So one of them noticed me. The other one did not. So I was watching the one it noticed that noticed me. I saw him. I backed out. I got on my hands and knees and started uh, crawling into that drainage and just, you know, creeping in and, and, and stalking one of those deer. But I was stalking the other one that mm. didn't see me. Meanwhile, the other one was watching me the whole time. Right. So... So there was, two, there was, uh, you know, two sets of eyes in there and I only thought there was one mm -hmm. until we got close enough. And I was just like, I told the guy, the camera guy, I was like, oh shit, man, I, <laughs> I, we're being watched. Right. And so we got in, we got into this, this, this high, you know, the, that 56, 57 yard range. And I said, let's just go for it. So I knocked up, drew back and drew back, you know, got on my knees and he was, he was gone. I yeah. mean, he was whoop, gone. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. That's one of the other kind of challenging pieces there, man. It's like when we talked earlier about you're not getting away with anything, it, you're usually, you know, if it, it's, it's kind of like I, I equated it to almost like elk hunting, you know, especially you know, for me out in Kansas during the rut, in, I, you, re, you rarely seen like a solo deer. It was usually like a deer, you know, a, a, a buck with a doe or whatever the case yeah. was. And so you were constantly battling like at least two sets of eyes and in, in, you know, four years and two noses the entire time, yeah. you know, um, which is always just added, you know, added bullshit. You got to kind of, kind of navigate. It's hard enough to try to beat one of them alone. You know, whenever you have to try to beat two or three of them at the same time is, 
is pretty tough. But you mentioned, you know, this piece being new to you. And so it's all, you know, you were kind of freelancing that spot, you know, just kind of yeah. winging it and figuring it out. And I love, that's like one of my favorite ways to hunt. That's the hunted Kansas that way, hunted Missouri that way. Like that's just how I, that's hunted Iowa that way. It's just, yep. and, and for me, it's just a really kind of freeing feeling to hunt that way because I don't have any preconceived notions of where a deer should be. I don't have any preconceived notions of how they should, you know, like, I think sometimes we get caught up in this idea, especially if we know a piece well, where we say, oh man, I want to kill that deer right here. Yeah. You know, as opposed to like, I need to be where the deer is and just kill him where he's at, you know, or whatever, yeah. whatever opportunity he presents. And so yeah. to me, whenever I'm freelancing, it takes that kind of part out of it. Cause I don't have any historical bias about an area. I'm just taking it at face value for what it's worth. Do you kind of feel the same yeah. way? I mean, do you feel like when you walk into places yeah. where you don't know jack shit about it, where you're just like, man, this feels awesome. Cause I have no clue what might be over this next horizon or in this next drainage. Yeah, man, it, you, in a way you have to be mm -hmm. right. You can't, you, you can't go into any hunt really with a preconceived notion of, of this is how it's going to go down tonight. Because I'll tell you right now, you get into that mindset, even in a, on a property that you think, you know, mm -hmm. and the deer are going to do something different. And then your, your ass is in the wind. So that's why I love these new, uh, these, these States like out West Colorado, uh, you know, the Dakotas, Nebraska, where there's all this public land and you can go into it and you can just be like, dude, I could, I can do whatever I want. And not only can I go do whatever I want this, I can be successful in multiple ways, yeah. right? I'm not, I'm not hunting a, a 20 acre piece of private that I, that I have access to, and I don't have access to any other place around it. I have access to 3000 acres right here mm -hmm. or 33,000 acres or whatever. And, and so the best part about this whole thing is that there's no there's no strategy there's strategy but there's no strategy because the strategy is so fluid and you can especially hunting from the ground yeah you can just be like hey this ain't working let's back out and, and loop around or you know let's let's move down this fence line uh, 30 more uh, more yards or whatever i know man like i i got back home and uh it was gun season or well, yeah. it was shortly gun season after i got back home so i didn't go out during gun season i uh, actually i went out twice I, I went out two different days and, and and hunted and both were from a tree and i was just kind of i was kind of missing being on the ground because i don't there's something about it to what exactly what you said where i can kind of i mean i can do it with you can do it with a saddle or a tree stand or whatever but there's a little bit more effort involved you got to tear some stuff down pack some stuff up but when you're on the ground when you make a decision that you need to be 60 yards over here, you just get up and go, you yeah. know, and there's something about that, that I really like. Now, I, I do feel, I, I do feel me personally that I'm at a disadvantage when I'm on the ground because I, I just, I can't, I can't see as much, you know, and I can't anticipate as much, but there are certainly, it's one of those things that as I become more comfortable with it, it's going to become something that's, that's worked into my repertoire, you yeah. know, more and more and more only because like, as I get more comfortable, I'll start seeking places out that are like, that are ground huntable only type of scenarios. Yeah. But I, I wanted to ask you this. Do you think, do you feel that once you started kind of taking these out of state trips and going to these places where you're, you don't have any preconceived, you don't have any historical bias in the strategy. Like you said, like there is like a high level kind of map strategy that you've looked at maps and you kind of say like, these places look good just from a terrain and topography kind of perspective, right. Or things that I look for. And, you know, that yeah. might be the case, but when you get there, it's a whole different ball game. And so you're really kind of making a strategy on the fly. Yeah. Do you feel like hunting like that when you go out of state and being forced to kind of hunt like that when you go out of state, do you feel like when you come back home to Iowa that it has made you a much sharper hunter for places that you do have familiarity with? Well, what it does is it allows me to make the decision of I should, or I should not hunt here faster. Mm -hmm. So, so, um, let's just say I'm on a piece of public in Iowa. I mean, it really doesn't matter where you're at, whether mm -hmm. it's public or private or whatever. It doesn't matter. Agree. Agree. All, all that, all that matters is do you feel based off of what you know about this, you know, and sometimes the, the thing about the, like where I was hunting out West, I was ab able to calculate decisions so much faster 
because I could see everything Mm -hmm. here in Iowa and I'm hunting a block of timber. I can only see the draw that I'm in, right? I can see that I can only see what's around me out there, man. I can see a hundred deer from where I'm sitting right now, but it's flat and I can see where they're moving. So I can say to myself, Hey, this spot isn't going to work. I need to move right now. Now in Iowa or in a, uh, in a place where there's more, more vegetation and you're hunting out of a tree stand, you may not get that insight until you physically the next hunt tear down and move over to the next ridge and set up. Yeah. Then you get that information, but the, the information where I was, where I was hunting out West, there was no, vet, there was not even an option to hang a tree stand at this, on this property. Yeah. Okay. There, there's no coming off of a river bottom and the river bottom had trees, but that was private and that was a no go. So I had, I, I had to, like, I had to hunt on the ground. I had to, you know, like think on the fly. I, I could see everything. So all this, you know, this equation that we use mentally to make decisions on where to hunt, how to hunt, um, what the wind's doing, uh, you know, like what's the, sh- what's the shade, you know, where's my scent cone going? All this stuff is, is being calculated so much faster. So you're able to make decisions. And I, I think when you're able to make quicker decisions, um, it just shortens up the, the hunt because you're either going to be successful quicker or you're going to fail quicker. Yeah. And what that allows you to do, whether you're successful, that's a win. But if you fail quicker, you're also able to rebound quicker and put more thought into the next hunt where there's the possibility of you also being successful quicker. Yeah. I mean, you hit the nail on the head with the <clears throat> with the whole intel in those scenarios flows quicker. It is just more yeah. fluid because you can see so much further. You, you just have yeah. that a, a wider swath of of intel. And I think that yep. the not last thing you hit on, I 100% agree with, you know, and I would add to it and say that the one thing that it's done for me is that because I don't know a lot about the spot that I might be at, other than what I'm phys- you know, like physically seeing at that at those moments, is that I'm not afraid to move and for fear of boogering up another spot because I don't know what is 300 yards away from me. Right. I need right. to actually, you know, uh, like the the Kansas and, you know, the Western states or like plain states notwithstanding because you can, of course, glass ahead of you. But in places where maybe you have, you know, even like in Kansas, there's, there's you know, big, you know, creek bottom draws and stuff like that that you can't see. So you have to just kind of physically go investigate. So yeah. in those types of scenarios, I don't know what's 300 yards down this down this creek bottom, I need to physically go walk to find it. And if I have an idea of what was down there previously, I might be hesitant to do that. Cause I'm like, Oh man, I know there's a big primary scrape down there. I don't want to walk down there. Cause I don't want to booger it up and I want to hunt it two days from now. I don't have any of that. So I just need to go check it out, you know? Yeah. And that's to me is like one of the kind of exciting parts is, is, is that, and it, that's the freeing part for me because, you know, I will, uh, personally, you know, try to avoid certain spots and try to hunt smart and, you know, and I know you do this too, as far as like try to hunt strategically and, you know, hunt the right winds and stuff like that. And if I know there's a potential that I might want to hunt that spot three weeks from now, you know, cause it might get, be better three weeks from now, I'll stay out of it. And I might need to know what's there today. <laughs> yeah. You know what I mean? It, so, you know, it's one of those things where, you know, in certain sen- senses, when you're in timbered areas, like you and I hunt, you know, typically, you know, you could be damned if you do and damned if you don't. And that's kind of like the mental game that you play with yourself where when you don't know, you're like, well, I need to be there to find out. So I'm just going to go. Yeah. And you know, the result is the result, whatever it happens to be. Yeah. So, and, and to, to be honest with you, the hunting strategy is you can't even compare it Mm -hmm. based off of where I'm at in Iowa. Okay. So I have a farm, I have access to it. I have trail cameras up. I, I have inventory. I know what caliber of deer that I'm after. There's a, there's, there's, you know, five deer that I would shoot that I have, uh, Intel on the rest is going to be judged as they cross my shooting lane. Right. Mm, right. Out there, it becomes so much to me more relaxing and easy because I don't know Mm -hmm. what is around every corner. Right. The, the deer that I shot this year, I, I was jacked when I saw him walking right towards me. I said to the, to the guy next to me, the guy filming, I said, Hey, I'm not going to make an adjustment for this deer, but if he falls in my lap, I'm going to shoot him. Mm -hmm. Right. And it wasn't because it wasn't because of his antlers or his age. It just, it just happened to be, I'm going to shoot this deer because our strategy worked. 
we were right. in the right right spot for a legal deer and this whitetail probably a two-year-old mm-hmm. if i had to guess comes walking in and and, and offered me a, a gorgeous shot and uh and i took it and it was one of those things where it's like it's so much it was so much more fun because of everything we already talked about it was the 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 new experience the shoot from the hip strategy and the not knowing what was out there and at this time you know i could see deer coming out of the river you know 500 yards further down the property and this was the best buck that i that i saw now the funny part is i shoot him i turn around and about 5 minutes later after he runs into this thicket uh like the big dogs all stepped out <laughs> of, of course property. they of course they did now stepped out but they were on the, they were yeah but they were on the private so who knows if they would have came, came, come this way or not so i felt i made the best decision and i will tell you right now that i was equally excited about shooting this buck than I was the the whitetail that I shot in Iowa. And two of the deer, two and a half de- of the deer that I shot in South Dakota could fit in the rack of the deer that I shot in in Iowa here. So the antler size has nothing to do with it. It yeah. it was it's it's the it's the hunt. Mm-hmm. It's the strategy. It's the the experience that I get freaking fired up about, man. Yeah, no, dude, I I 100% agree with you. you know, that's one of my favorite things, and that's why when I say freeing, you know, and I'll just be trans. I'm you know I'm brutally transparent all the time. You know, yeah. I know I know you are too. You know, it. I'd be lying if I said you know. Look, we both run <clears throat> hunting podcasts. You know, we've both been doing this stuff for for a while, and so there is an element of, you know. Um, I don't want to keep it up with the Joneses like might be one way to say it. I don't think that's the right way to say it, but I'd be lying if I said like, there isn't some level of like outside pressure that I sometimes kind of feel like where it's like, Oh man, you know, want to kill a good buck or, you know, I'm on a streak where I haven't filled a tag in two years. Well, this year's not over yet, but you know, two years I haven't, haven't filled a tag. Um, you know, and so there's a little bit of, a little bit of that, especially whenever, when I'm in my home state, um, when I travel, I kind of leave all that behind. Like yeah. you're like you're saying where I'm, I'm, I'm going, I'm out in the middle of wherever I am. I have no clue what's here. Like when I went to Kansas, someone was like, Oh, you know, Kansas, you know that, um, how, what do you know about Kansas? It's like, I don't know. I've never seen it until I crossed the state line. You know, yeah. I was like, I've never been there. And, you know, so there's a little bit of, when I say freeing, it's not just freeing from like a strategy standpoint where you can kind of, you're forced to make some decisions on the fly and maybe make some mistakes. It's also freeing in the sense of like, I have zero expectation of what I'm going to shoot. I'm going to shoot whatever it is that comes by me that I get real excited about, whatever yeah. that, ha- whatever that happens to be, you know what I mean? Whether it's a two year old, a four year old, a five year old, a doe, like I don't really have any expectation. It's about having the experience and just trying to, you know, challenge myself to hunt a place that's new and, and figure it out. Like that's really, yeah. the, that's really the, like the fun part. It's like, it's the strat. It's like, can I figure this out or not? It's almost like an internal yeah challenge with myself of can i actually go somewhere and do i know enough about what the hell i'm talking about to actually go figure this out yeah and and man the first two years i went to south dakota i had an absolute blast and i ate my tag Mm -hmm. like i learned a lot but but that same time i go to iowa here and there's something about your home state there's Mm -hmm. something about property that you're familiar with there's something about there, there's man i'll i'll just kind of change change it all here but there's something about hunting that i love that will never be explained yeah. it will never be written in a book it will never be written in an article it will never be discussed on a podcast because the experience that i have is going to be different from you and everyone who's listening to this right now and that is what eats me up every yeah. year is because there's no explanation for why we are so crazy about all this shit. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I was talking to, uh, I was talking to my buddy, um, the bow, Greg Litzinger, the bow hunting fiend. And we were oh, yeah. kind of, we were kind of joking cause 
you know, he's, we've both kind of had a similar season where we both had some decent bucks. He, you know, he lives in New Jersey. He had some decent bucks that he was chasing in New Jersey. He kind of had not the drop on, but he knew, you know, where they were spending some time. And similar with me and PA kind of had a good beat on a couple deer and it was just, you know, missing them by a day, almost like every time, you know, I'd, I'd hunt a spot and then, you know, I'd check a trail camera and realize, oh yeah, cool. He came through like uh, 50 yards from here the day before I got here, you know, <laughs> or like 12 hours after I was here. Um, and we both were kind of joking where, you know, almost like, Hey, looking forward to uh, the season being over. Cause like, then the fun really starts, you know, cause we almost both look forward to the, I mean, I love bow hunting, but I love the, like the aspect of scouting and trying to figure it out and put the puzzle and the plan together for the next season. Like I just, I live for that shit. Like I love to go scout. I love to kind of go to new places in my home state and explore new, new areas and figure out new ground and stuff like that. That's just something that I get super fired up about. And that's to me is the, you know, the experience. I think that's kind of what you're talking about. It's just like, there's something yeah. about it that you can't explain, you know, and whether it's a filled tag or not, like it's I just a, get fit. I just get fired up for it. It's almost like the best hunts when you're on the best hunts. You don't even, it's like you almost forget that you're hunting. Yeah. Right. Like you're sitting in a tree stand and you're just absorbing nature and, and you're, you're on the top of this ridge and you can see for miles and miles and miles with your spotter and, and you're sitting up there and you're going, dude, the, the entire human race, a majority of the human race is missing out on this right now. Yeah. Like it, it just, it, it really does like make you aware of how disconnected the human race is yeah. from mother nature. Yeah. And I, I, that's a great point, man. Cause I try to take a moment on every hunt. Like, uh, I guess like consciously take a moment, right. You're yeah. kind of subconsciously absorbing these things. And, but I try to take a, a serious moment every time I go out on a trip and just kind of absorb something. And, and this trip was no different where, you know, I got out there a day before Chad did, and then, he, you know, we took my travel trailer out, and we were staying in that, and we were staying on a piece of Weehaw that, you know, the landowner, um, it's public, I mean, it's all open for public access, but he was letting us kind of keep my my trailer there and camp there, and um, he, uh, so he got out there the next, or that, late that night or whatever, and so the next morning we were getting up, and we weren't sure exactly where we were going, so we, were, we weren't going to walk in, in the dark and kind of blow a bunch of deer out, you know, and so, you know, we both kind of agreed like, well, Hey, let's, let's wait. You know, we both had long, long ass drives. We'll get up tomorrow early, get up, have some coffee, you know, and wait for daylight to crack. Then we were just going to basically be driving and glassing, trying to, trying to find deer out, you know, in a field to, to stalk. And, uh, we got up and I stepped outside the trailer and just, I mean, I took a picture of it and it's just like a gorgeous Kansas, as far as the eye can see skyline, like perfect kind of orange bleeding into like purple color of sky. There was an old farmstead. It was kind of dilapidated. That was there that was where the sun was coming up. It was only, it was only showing you like the silhouette of it, like just picturesque out of a movie. Yeah. And, you know, and I remember stepping outside and I said to Chaz, like, dude, I was like, you gotta come out and see the sky. You know, and he walked out and I was like, dude, I was like, this, I was like, this is awesome. You know, yeah. I was like, you know, aside from, from bow hunting white tails, I was like, that's the shit. <laughs> you know, I was like, it just doesn't get any better than that. Like the scenery hunting whitetails being there with a buddy. It's just, it just doesn't, it doesn't get much better than that, man. Yeah. It's almost like, dude, am I the only person alive right now? Yeah. Yeah. Totally. It's crazy. Yeah, I love it. I love it. Yeah. So man, this, so you, you, you finally arrow this buck in the Dakotas and the retrieval was kind of crazy. Wasn't it? If I'm not mistaken. Yeah. He, he uh, Hard quartering shot. And, uh, you know, we, we all have these shots, uh, like my, the, my, I, I'll just preface this, my white tail buck. I hit, he was, he was, uh, 10 steps. I drilled him through the chest. He took two leaps and died. I <laughs> watched him fall over inside. I had a similar shot with this, uh, buck in South Dakota. I hit him a hair back at a, at a hard quartering towards and I hit liver and my arrow went through, you know, the guts and all mm -hmm. that stuff and, and came out of his hind quarter <laughs> and uh, really good blood and all that stuff. But long story short, you know, I, I 
I would give him a, I give him an hour. And then I'm like, dude, he was bleeding really bad when we saw him disappear into this thicket. And, uh, but I'm like, Hey man, I feel confident that my, my broadhead did some damage and I'm going to go, I'm going to go look for him. And we found some good blood and, and we got the blood into the thicket and it was real, I mean, piles of it. And, you know, one of those, one of those piles of blood where you just go dead deer, yeah. right? Yeah. Dead deer. Well, we, uh, we, we tracked him and then all of a sudden we got into some tall grass and we lost blood. Hmm. And so I started like, and it was right at that time of day where flashlights really aren't doing anything. It mm-hmm. was still light out, but the flashlights almost, I don't know, it, it closes off your vision, right? The rest of your vision. If, 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 if anybody's ever been in that scenario before. So I'm, I'm starting to grid search and I'm kicking up deer left and right, man. And, um, my camera guy all of a sudden is like, Hey, 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 come here, come here, come here. And he's floating in the river. <laughs> so, so I had to, I had to literally jump into the river and grab him before he floated off. And I never, it was like perfect timing because I, if, if, if I didn't go get him, I was never going to find him. He would have been a mile down, down river. So I grabbed him and I had to, you know, I, I, got up to my waist in water, pulled him up to, uh, luckily the river was shallow and I pulled him up onto the, I uh, pulled him up onto some, like a gravel bed. And then my cameraman helped me up this steep bank. I probably would have had to quarter him out in the river if I was by myself. Hmm. Uh, I don't, I do not think I would have been able to pull that whole deer up off on this mud bank hmm. um, by myself. Uh, and he wasn't, I mean, like I said, he was a two year old, so he wasn't, uh, he wasn't giant bodied at all. It just would have been really difficult. Uh, and then, you know, uh, gutted him and I pulled him out. So it was, uh, we had, we had a little help from the, the guy who ran cattle. He brought his side by side up and all I had to do was drag it about a hundred yards out of the timber. I gutted him. I, I took him or I got him out of the river the my camera guy he went back to the truck and got the landowner or not the landowner but the uh, guy who ran the cattle on the, on the property and he got his side by side and drove down and then i by that time i pulled him out of the uh out of the river uh, out of the river bank and got him up to a point where the about 100 yards by myself and got him to the the, the thicket edge and he was able to pull right up and, and load him up. So That's, I was, uh, I was very thankful for, for that guy. Right. Now the, the big question is, did yeah. you derobe before you got into the river? Did you go in fully clothed? So it was one of those things where he's floating and I'm just like, and, and the current was moving pretty quickly. So I was just like, I, if I'm going to go, I'm going to go now. And it was a muddy type scenario. So I was like, I don't know if I'm like what the scenario is. So I'm just going to leave my boots on. I'm going to leave my pants on. I took all my electronic. I took my phone out of my pocket, took my hat off, put my phone and my release and everything in there. And uh, I jumped in the river and started tr- you know, like trekking after him. So uh, it was cold. The water, <laughs> the, the water was extremely like dirty and it was dark. So I couldn't. Only thing I could see was the moon. And I didn't, I had my, I had my headlamp, uh, like I thought I was going to have to swim. Mm -hmm. So I, cause I didn't know how deep it was. So I took my headlamp off even and put it in there. So it's, you know, it's borderline dark. And the only thing that's really lighting anything up was the the moon. And so here I thought I was going to have to swim, but I only had to go waist deep, grabbed him and, uh, you know, got him, what, got him out, man. What I'm envisioning is like the scenario in my head, like, which would have been awesome. Would have been like, Oh my God, I got to get him. And you take yeah. off running, like to jump in, like full on belly flop, but there's no, it's like an inch of water. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. You know, it's like one of those. Yeah. Oh, I, man. I honestly didn't know what to expect. Um, right. And here's the crazy part. There's a lot of coyotes out there. Right. Mm-hmm. And as I'm, as I am pulling this deer out of 
like I'm dragging him upstream now to come to get to a point on this gravel bed that I mentioned earlier. There is a coyote on the other side of the bank who's already caught the the scent of this deer and his blood and all this stuff. And he's just staring at me like once my boys get here, you're I'm coming for you. It was it was uh, it was crazy. But and then they all started going crazy as I'm, I'm, you know, in the background, they're going crazy as I'm gutting this uh, as I'm gutting this animal. And the only thing that's running through my head, you go to Nebraska, you go to the Dakotas and you talk to any local out there. The only thing that they're talking about is mountain lions. Hmm. They're going, dude, our mountain lion population has exploded. Mountain lions, mountain lions, mountain lions. And so here I am going, dude. Mountain lion, you won't hear it coming. You're not going to oh, hear yeah. anything. You know, it's just going to be, you're going to, it's going to have the death grip on you. And the next thing you know, you're going to slowly fade to black. Yep. Damn. That's the only thing I'm thinking of as I'm gutting and dragging this deer out of, out of the timber. So yeah. um, I, I made a, made quick work of that. Yeah, no doubt, man, for sure. Like I, I, I would have too. <laughs> you know, and even just like a pack yeah. of coyotes, like they just like, oh. I don't like coyotes, man. Like they, they're just, you know when you hear them kind of start yipping, especially if you got something down or whatever, there's a, there's a crew of them. It's like, all right, man, it, is one of you going to get sporty or not? You know, it's like, you- Oh yeah. And last, last year in December, when I went back to South Dakota, I'm walking this real thick, uh, bottom of this drainage, the tops are wide open. The bottoms were all cedars. And I come up through this opening and I am watching a, I'm watching a coyote stare right at me I like yeah. we just kind of crossed paths and i said to myself well where there's one there's got to be two right and he made some little yep noise and i look have you ever seen the jurassic park movies where the, the they're talking about how velociraptors hunt yeah and and how one's in front of you that's where all your attention's at but you're going to get attacked from the side mm-hmm. dude th- that is exactly what happened I'm watching a coyote right in front of me. He makes a noise and I catch some movement over to my, to my, uh, uh, right. And there's another one. And then there's another one to my left. And then the, the one in front of me takes like, starts doing that, that thing that animals do where they're just walking real slowly towards you. Mm -hmm. Like it's going to start coming. And I'm like, holy shit, I'm going to get attacked by coyotes right now. (laughs) So I made an aggressive move towards the coyote that I saw in front of me. And he ended up was like, oh, shit, this thing's bigger than I thought. And he turned around and ran away. And then with him, six coyotes came out of that. They were probably all within 40 or 50 yards of me. It was it was it was one of those. Oh, shit moments. Yeah, it's a little unnerving, man, for sure. Yeah. You know, yeah. But uh, so, man, let's transition to your Iowa hunt now, dude, because like so you had that killer hunt. Uh, in, in October and now we're headed to Iowa and, you know, I'm pretty sure people probably know that you, you, you know, got it done in Iowa and killed a great deer, but I'm just curious how everything kind of came together. I mean, did you, did you know this deer was there? Did you have any Intel on him? Like how did this hunt all kind of, kind of play out? Did you have good encounters leading up to that? Or was your season kind of slow in Iowa prior to that? What was the kind of, what was the deal? So right before the season started, I lost 103 acres of prime ground. Oh, um, guy, the guy uh, called me up and said, it, it, "It's it's a crazy story." The guy called me up and said, "Hey man, uh, yeah, you can't hunt on this piece anymore." And I just got permission from it from his brother the previous year. It was a group of brothers that owned the property, and one told me I could without discussing it with the rest of the brothers. So then they found out and they're just like, no, man, we bought this property to, to, to hunt. Why are you letting some other guy hunt it? Right. So, mm-hmm. so that, that's a no go completely understand yep. no hard feelings, whatever that shit happens every year almost. So it cut out a big chunk of property for me. So I was left with the rest of the, the farm to go and hunt mm-hmm. and, uh, n- not a big deal. There's, there's good deer everywhere. So the first thing that I do when I start my rut vacation is I, I go check every trail camera on the property to see what's running around. Mm -hmm. And so I I checked half of the farm and then I went in to hunt that night. 
yeah, that night. And uh, while I was there on my way in, I or on my way out, I checked or I pulled a whole bunch of cards. Uh-huh. And I got a picture of this really wide deer. One that I eventually shot and then uh, a good eight pointer. And really, there was only two deer on the farm that I would consider shooters at this point. Uh-huh. Um, nothing like usually it's more than that. But the last couple of years, the farm has just not been uh, producing like it normally has. Not not 100 percent sure why it just hasn't. Uh-huh. Now. Kind of foreshadowing a little bit. I also share this hunting property. It's a it's a permission piece with two slash three other hunters Mm -hmm. two of them are bow hunters the other one is i say bow hunter in quotation marks he's he's up there in age so he's kind of slowing down but he still comes out he has a crossbow Mm -hmm. and then um anyway long long story short these guys were hunting and they have permanent stands and so uh the permanent stand scenario like they're not mobile so i like I kind of have been respecting that and I stay kind of out of that area in the past. I've, I've put my, my, myself to flank their position because what, what tends to happen is the deer know that these guys are in, in these permanent stands. And so they flank the positions, Mm -hmm. but I stay away from where they're hunting. And I, I've been, I was hunting a different bedding area. I checked the trail. I checked a couple trail cameras and, um, uh, noticed this, a couple of deer. And for some reason, when I saw this picture of this wide buck, I said, that's now my target. I okay. want this guy. I want, I want him. So I checked all the trail trail cameras and I had kind of half of a triangular triangulization, triangular triangulization. Tri- how do, how do you say that? Hey, I'm, I'm going with that. Yeah. Right. Yeah. <laughs> so I was, long story. I was trying to try, uh, triangulate his position and I only had really two points that I needed. And I said, God, I, 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 my gut feeling tells me he's coming around this ridge point and heading up to this ag field. Um, and that was exactly where these other two hunters had close to where they're staying. So I was staying out of it. So a couple hunts went by and I was going back to kind of the same spot. And I, I'm, you know, we're in good graces with each other. We text each other, ask how everybody, how we're doing. Mm-hmm. And they said, Hey, we're not going to be out here tonight. And I said, opening, right? So yeah, knowing, so knowing two hunts worth of data, and I think it was like uh, uh, two nights worth of data um, that I said to myself, well, I'm, I'm moving in. So I packed up a stand, put it on my back and went exactly to where I thought the, these deer would be coming out of this, this bedding area and like half mooning it in like half circling it up this ridge and heading up to, to this egg field. And I thought, honestly, I was going to run into a whole bunch of does and the, the bucks were going to be behind them coming, coming through. Hmm. Well, as I'm setting up this tree stand in this spot, I have a, a gorgeous 140 class 10 pointer what maybe 145 class 10 pointer thinking he's a three-year-old uh i'm halfway up my sticks <laughs> and he he comes in and so i'm hanging out there my my calves start cramping whatever he he kind of catches catches me moving doesn't really spook but just says i i'm out of here you know I'm, I'm gonna go away i finish setting up and my my the you know, I'm south wind, uh, high grounds to the south. If anything comes high of me, there's a good chance they might see me. Uh, but it's first time in, best time in scenario. Yep. So uh, the wind's coming over top. It's blowing off this ridge down into the, the bottom ag field. I'm about 60 to 70 yards off the field edge at this point, up mm-hmm. into this uh, little ridge, this knob, mm-hmm. where, like I said, this one ridge kind of connects with another ridge and I'm, it's about, I don't know. I got in there kind of late. It was about four something. Mm -hmm. Uh, It was before the time change. It was, this was, this was November 4th. So I'm sitting, I'm sitting there. Here comes another little buck. 
And I'm like, oh, cool, man. Like the deer, like the deer are in the area. Yeah. Right. It's, and it's just one of those, and it wasn't too terribly cold. It wasn't like a, it was like a, it, if you were going to listen to someone who knew something about hunting, they'd probably tell you, Hey, maybe you shouldn't hunt tonight because, uh, <laughs> this, right. this isn't lining up. These things right. aren't lining up, Yeah. but you know, F that stuff. Yeah. Um, <laughs> you know, agreed. So, so this buck comes in and mills around a little bit, goes away. Another forky comes in, mills around, goes away. And they're, he's, they're all going up this, this drainage. And I'm like, Hey man, I, I feel like I'm in the right spot. So I look, uh, most of the leaves are off the tree. I look to my, I look to the North and there's a, I put my binos up on this deer. That's kind of in this field. He's trotting. It's almost like he's on a fast walk. and he, I see, holy shit, that's a shooter. That looks like a shooter. And he's about 150 yards away. So I crack that, I pick up the antlers, crack them together. And um, he stops and he comes in on a frozen rope right to, Man. right to me. You got to love that. And dude. holds up at about, yeah, holds up at about 60 yards. And this was what I call a teeter totter buck, where it's just like, I could shoot him and be happy, but at the same time, I could pass him and it's no, you know, no skin off my ass type of, right. Type of buck. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And so I, and so he's sitting there, gorgeous 10, uh, probably again, 145, Mm -hmm. but he has way more mass. I could have been a four year old. Um, he had a, 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 like, a a awesome hook kicker coming off of his main beam. Awesome character. And I reach into my bag to try to find my, uh, like grab my grunt call. It's not there. Hmm. And I'm just like, Oh man, I left my grunt call in my truck. <laughs> and so the uh, only thing I knew what to do was snort wheezed at him. Hmm. And I was just like, you know, threw the snort wheeze at him and he got curious for a second, but as he's working his way, it's like, he's not getting ga- He's not gaining ground and he's not losing ground. He's coming in at an angle that's just completely paralleling me. And I, I'm not going to take a 60 yard shot in the timber. Right. And so he gets to about 60 completely broadside on me. Then he drops back down, hits the field edge, walks away. It's, it's like, it's almost like he knew I was there, but he didn't know I was there. And then came around to try to get downwind of the noise that he heard. Mm. And my thermals were just kicking that night. So everything was up. Nice. And, and so he loops around and he comes into this draw and I, I lose him, but I can hear him making scrapes like on the dry leaves, just like, you know, yeah, a dragon's feet. And so I snort wheeze again. And, uh, and then I just can, I can barely see him working his way up. I snort wheeze again. And then I see him turn just slightly, I believe. And I go to put my binos up in that direction and I see a set of antlers and I'm just like, man, that those antlers don't look like his. And this head swings around and I'm like, oh shit, it's the wide, the wide buck. He's, <laughs> he's out of nowhere. So was he, so hold on. So was he down in that, down in that, so that buck went down into a draw or went down into a low area, right? Yeah. That, yes. Okay. So yeah. was that. Do you think that that buck other buck was down there already? Or no. do you think it's, do you think that he heard the commotion and was like, "Hey, what the hell's going on in here over here?" So, I was so focused on this buck that my gut tells me he crossed my access route and was already up in this area the whole time that I Got was it. setting up. Got but it. just never never saw me um hit up because <laughs> it's pretty it's pretty thick on this knob. And then when I started snort wheezing, that got his attention and brought him in. And then he probably so, smelled that other deer and was like, well, who the hell is he snort wheezing at? What the hell's going exactly, on? Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. I'm about to go kick somebody's ass is what he was thinking. Yeah. So this, this buck comes up back up the ridge, the one that I just saw and has like a, a meeting with this buck, just like head to head. And they're probably about 15 yards apart. And this big wide buck just goes to town on a tree and this other 10 was just like, uh, uh-uh. uh, <laughs> like, I'm not ready for this shit yet. Yeah. And he kind of, he kind of loops back around. 
and he's 30 broadside couldn't you know could have had a shot on him but my I, all my focus was on this buck mm-hmm. so he goes to town on this tree and he stops and you know how sometimes when a deer shows up quick you get fired up mm-hmm. you black out a little bit you black <laughs> out a little bit yeah and then you're just like uh whatever uh it's not you know it, it, and then then it happens but i was able to black out come off of it and make start making good decisions right right so he he was raking he was raking this tree just destroying it and then he kind of looks back towards the direction of this buck and i thought he was going to walk away so i snort wheezed at him and he kind of stopped his ears came back but he never turned his head hmm. and then he went right back to uh you know he went right back to raking this tree in a sign of dominance mm-hmm. and so he stopped again and it it looked like he was going to start walking away again. So I snort wheezed at him one more time. And that time it was kind of it. He was just like, dude. All right. I've given you, I've given you a couple warnings. I'm about to, I'm about to come over and throw down. Yeah. Like, yeah. Don't you see what I'm doing to this tree? I'm about ready to do this to you. Right. And so he turns around, he's broadside at 40, but there's a, a, a dead tree in the way. No shot. Right. And so he starts angling up this, this ridge and he is, uh, he's, a, he's a, this, this trail that he's on is going to give me the perfect broadside at exactly 20 yards. I ranged a tree right in front of this tree, 20 yards. Well, before he hits this tree, there's a maple which still had his leaves on it. And he hits that tree, takes a 90 degree turn and he starts walking right towards me. <laughs> so he's under this tree. And it was one of those moments where he's, remember I said that now he's higher than me. Right. Yeah. Well, so I had to be very careful on everything that was going down. So I had to do the, the draw from the chest, mm. like real slow draw from the chest, bring it up and kind of get anchored. And by this time he had come out of the tree, uh, out from under the tree. He's, he's, you know, my tree's probably 18 to 20 feet or my stand is probably 18 to 20 feet off the ground where he was at was probably 10 feet off the ground, right? So, so he's right at me, 10 feet. I'm drew, drew back. I'm right in that crease, right where the, that neck muscle meets the shoulder and, uh, let it fly, man. And I just buried it in him and he was dead in under 10 seconds. Wow, man. That's crazy, dude. That's, yeah. I, it's, it's funny. Cause I've known, I think I can't think of who the third person is, but I know it's at least three people this year that I know that took that same exact shot this year. Yeah. And all three were like, uh, actually I know who it was. It's, it's, uh, you, uh, Cameron, camera guy from, from Exodus. And then my buddy, Aaron, all three took that same exact, you know, hard quartering two or almost head up shot and just buried it. And, got everything from asshole to appetite <laughs> so yeah. essentially, you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, and it, in, in all, in every case, it was like the deer was done in like 50 yards or under, you know, no more than 50 yards in every, yeah. in every scenario. Yeah. Yep. It was one of those things where I cut the, the, I shoot a three blade blade expandable from wasp and it went into his chest. It cut his jugular. It cut his windpipe. It went into, so there, so it didn't hit the heart or the lungs, but there's that connective tissue that connects the heart and the lungs. Mm-hmm. And it went right into that. And when I was gutting him and pulling all, everything out, his heart was almost free in there. And so it just kind of rolled out. Wow. That's crazy, man. That's an easy gut yeah. job. You know, it oh, like, yeah. makes yeah. makes that easy, man. Yeah. I know we've been, we've been rolling for almost an hour and a half here, brother. And I want to be sensitive to your time, but one last quick question, just cause I'm just cause I'm curious, what are you, what are you getting into next year, dude? Like, what are your plans? Do you have plans for next year already? Or are you still kind of making those? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm in the process of making them I'm, You know, guys like us, we always think about it, right? Yeah, exactly. Uh, we're always thinking about our next move. Um, I got preference points in Wyoming for elk, mule deer, and antelope. So that might be an option. There's always Colorado over the counter elk. Mm -hmm. Um, definitely going back to one of the plain States again, definitely Iowa again, Uh, like Missouri's in, in the hopper, potentially Wisconsin's in the hopper, potentially. Um, so 
right now is the year right now is the time of year where i i just list out all the uh, possibilities and then as as we get into spring and you know as i have to you know for for the, the time coming up pretty soon to apply for some of these preference preference points hunts is coming up pretty soon yeah. so i got to make that decision and then all of the other hunts revolve around that right then yeah. at that point so you know i'm always going to hunt iowa because i live here yep but i don't know man it's at this time it's just gathering information and and uh trying to cross something off off my list but i will tell you this i'm not getting any younger mm-hmm. and i'm i'm thinking in the next three three-ish years i'm gonna go ahead and try to get a, a caribou hunt scheduled nice, nice. yeah so. that's awesome man i'm right now i'm in the books for idaho elk uh yep. probably opening weekend or that opening week i think is where i'm gonna go the plan is to go back to Kansas and revenge myself or revenge my uh, failures there from this year. And then, of course, uh, Pennsylvania, probably going to spend a lot more time on the uh, the big woods piece that I've been scouting over the past, you know, well, I guess it'll be a year that I've been scouting yeah. it, you know, this this spring. Um, but that's probably the plans, yeah. plans for me. But you got an open invite to Pennsylvania, man. Yep. We'll hunt some big woods together whenever you want. All you right. Can, you can hang out in the rut wagon and the rut trailer with me, dude. I can put you up be uh oh yeah we'll be good we'll we'll drink whiskey and and chase mountain whitetails so whenever you're whenever you're ready to uh see a bunch of fort corn 85 inch deer <laughs> you let me know <laughs> hey man i tell you what i am not the type who uh especially out of state i i, I am an equal opportunity slayer so if if something comes through i'll shoot it there you go, brother. All right. Well, hey, before I let you go, man, let people know where they can find out more about you, follow what you got going on. And you got some of these hunts coming out on video or out on uh, YouTube too, right? Yep. Uh, Sportsman, Sportsman, M-E-N-S, Sportsman's Nation YouTube channel, Sportsman's Nation uh, podcast network, uh, Nine Finger Chronicles. I mean, any of those things to work, uh, just, you know, I'm, I'm kind of all over. Yeah, exactly. So check him out, folks. You won't be disappointed. And brother, until next time, I'll uh, I'll talk to you soon. Merry Christmas. Happy New Year. Have a happy and safe holiday. Hope your family stays uh, stays good and safe and enjoy that family time and uh, kick some ass in that card game. Yeah, that's a fact, man. You too. All right, folks, that is a wrap for today's show. I'd like to thank all of you for listening. And if you haven't yet, please head over to iTunes and leave us a five-star rating. And hell, while you're at it, head over to YouTube and give us a sub there too. I'd be super appreciative if you'd be able to do those two things for me. And before I shut this thing down, I need to give a big shout out to our partners who continue to help us make this podcast possible. Tethered, Spartan Forge, Exodus Outdoor Gear, and Skull Brew Coffee Company. And until next time, we'll see y'all.